Well, Pastor Sam and I, Tracy, we go back uh, a number of years. We uh, we were pastoring the Christian Assembly Church in uh, Elwood City for a while, and uh, Sam and I would get out and, and walk. Our sons, our, our two older boys especially, uh, they managed to get in trouble together. Uh, I just praise God that uh, both Jeffrey Jr. and Mark, uh, they, they have seen the error of their ways that they didn't follow the, the uh, negative direction that they were going at one point in time. It's, it's good to be with you, it really is. Uh, it's good to see Michael and, and uh, Christina. We haven't seen Christina, well, we haven't seen either one of them in probably 15 years, I'm guessing. Uh, maybe longer than that. And so it's, it's good to be here. I, uh, I come from, from uh, northern Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, my sister and I were raised up there. Uh, it's, we affectionately say that, that we're part of God's frozen chosen. If you are, uh, it's been said that a favorite scripture is, many are cold, a few are frozen. Uh, I, it truly is a, a beautiful city. Uh, it was a great place to grow up. Um, but uh, winters come early. Winter stays long. Actually, they say that northern Minnesota really have three seasons. You've got winter, winter's coming, and you've got uh, road repair. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's probably true of many places. But uh, it, I, go, uh, I go way back in Foursquare. I was saved in uh, Baptist Church uh, when I was 10 years old. But uh, Foursquare is in the family. My, uh, my grandmother was one of the charter members of the Foursquare Church in Duluth, Minnesota. And uh, that was probably way back in the 30s. And uh, it's a situation where uh, I don't know that I really had any kind of choice in what I would do with my, with my life. Uh, I was told that when I was just uh, an infant, my grandmother put me in her, her sewing basket, set the basket on top of the piano, and started playing the piano, singing, praying, and she prayed then that this grandson would be a preacher. And so my grandmother's prayers uh, went, went far. Uh, I mean, that woman was a praying woman. Amen. She was an evangelist. Um, once she got saved, uh, she would go into the bars and she would start passing tracks from one end of the bar to the next, uh, to the other end. When she got down the other end, uh, she would begin to preach. She'd preach a gospel message. And it said that, that my grandmother got kicked out of a lot more bars after she got saved than before. <laughs> if she was going through the bar and she happened to see one of her kids there, uh, she would whisper to them that yeah, she was ashamed to see him there, and she would just continue on to the other end of the bar. I, you know, I'm not going to uh, go on with with my grandmother, but she was a great, a great woman. Um, there's a story that was told to me about uh, well, a couple of them. Uh, my wife, she just raised her eyebrows. You know what that means. It means you're, you're getting off track, you better get back on track. Uh, but my grandmother didn't have a car at the time. It was uh, the Depression era. And she was taking uh, the family to church. And it was a walk. I think they walked a mile or so to, to get to the Gospel Tabernacle where she was attending at the time. And. Uh, as she's walking along, she's picking up everybody else as she goes. And she happened to stop at this one house, and she asked the woman if she would like to attend church with her. 
And uh, the woman says, Alice, I really would love to attend with you, but I just worked a double shift as a nurse, and I, I took my shoes off, and I am absolutely certain I can't keep my shoes back on. And my grandmother said, no, that's no problem. She says, sit here. She took the woman's hand, uh, feet in her hands, and she prayed. Uh, the swelling went down in her feet, and the woman went on to church with her. You know, I tell that story, and that's the kind of uh, faith that, that I heard as a child, and that's, that's what I want for my life. I want to be that kind of person that uh, it doesn't matter who I meet, I can minister to them. Uh, I have church a lot of times at the giant eagle waiting line. You know, you, you meet somebody, you find out that they're a believer in Christ, and all of a sudden, where two or three are gathered there, God is in the midst, and we have church. We have church. And I, I declare to you this morning that the Lord is present in his house. Hallelujah. He is here. And I have long believed that wherever God is present, anything can happen. Anything can take place. Well, on to the sermon. I am uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. And uh, I've been praying for Pastor Sam and, and Tracy that uh, God will bless them on a much needed vacation. So, have you ever attended a beautiful wedding or gone to a, a restaurant or maybe saw one in the in the movie where it was an elaborate setup? I mean, they, they, the 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 uh, tablecloths were were linen and uh, you had waiters in in uniform. We were just at a restaurant a few weeks ago in uh, Washington, D.C. area at the Indian restaurant, and the waiter staff stood at attention uh, on, the, on the side of the, the, uh, uh, the room waiting for anybody that had a need. But uh, you know what I'm talking about, uh, linen tablecloths, uh, linen napkins, uh, three forks, why you need three forks is beyond me, but, you know, they would say there was a dinner fork, uh, fork a salad fork, a dessert, a dessert fork, uh, a charger plate. Uh, I've never figured that one out either. Uh, you know, I would get rid of the other plate because the charger plate is bigger, you can get more stuff on it. But you've got your charger plate, you've got your regular dinner plate, there's a bread plate, a dinner knife, a salad knife, a soup spoon, a dessert spoon. And, uh, you know, it's just, you anticipate with all of that that it's going to be a fantastic meal. Well, God has got a table set for us. He's got a table set. And he's lavishly prepared everything that we have needed. There's absolutely nothing that you have a legitimate need for that God has not made provision for. I believe that. His grace has prepared a bountiful meal for each one of us, for our enjoyment, for our nourishment, for our strength. The question is for each and every one of us, will we partake of everything that God has for us? Will we partake of what he has placed on the table? If you've got your Bibles, whether it's on a phone or a tablet or, uh, you know, it's gotten to a place where there are not that many people that carry the book. But uh, I'm for one that I, well, I don't have a smartphone. I'm not intelligent enough to use it. But uh, I like to carry the book. Second Peter, the first chapter. And I want to read verses 2 to 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us 
uh, by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through those you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. The message Bible says it like this. Everything that goes into a life that's pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. The best invitation that we ever received. We were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you. Your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on a world corrupted by lust. Grace sets the table. It's faith that partakes. What's on the table? Well, our text uses some inclusive words. It says everything, all things, everything that we have need of living a godly life is on the table. I'm going to mention a couple, of, two or three things uh, this morning that by his grace he set up for us. The first of all is you cannot possibly live a godly life without God. God is on the table. Uh, we all know that God is a triune being. Uh, he's distinct in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that the Father is in heaven. Jesus is at the right hand uh, of God. And the Holy Spirit of God then has been poured out on the church and dwells within the life of every believer. So it's correct to say concerning living a godly life, that the most important person is the Holy Spirit who is going to reveal Jesus to us. We need the Spirit's uh, input in our hearts and lives. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You can't live a godly life without the Spirit of God. He abides in us by His Holy Spirit. He leads us, He guides us, He directs us, He speaks to us. Uh, he ministers all the time. Without Him, we can do nothing. But the opposite is true, that with Him, all things are possible for us to do. Uh, Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give you life. He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. The Phillips translation says it this way, Nevertheless, once the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives within you, He will, by that same Spirit, bring to your whole being new strength and vitality. There's spiritual life on the table. Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 20 says, Now unto him who is able. Well, that would excite me right there. He is able. Then it says, to, He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. Hallelujah. We can get excited about that. And it goes on and says, of all that we could ask or think. I don't know about you, but I can think of some wonderful things. I can think of this, uh, every seat in this place being filled. I can think of people standing on the side. I can, I can think of people uh, being on the outside with the windows open, listening in. I can think of the, the parking lot being full. I can think of a whole new building. Uh, you know, I can think of these things and the Word of God says that He'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that we would ask or think. I can think of God moving by His Spirit. I can think of the altar being filled with people that are seeking salvation, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I can think of a a prayer line where people are getting healed one after another after another. And I can think of a, a, a people being healed of diseases 
that is absolutely uh, beyond anything that the doctors are, uh, they've given up on them. Yes. But I want, I want you to know that there is no disease that God cannot cure. Amen. He is the great physician. He is the healer. I'm thankful for medical science. I'm thankful for all they did. I was at the VA just this last week, got a shot in my shoulder. I'm thankful for it. Uh, but I want you to know that Jesus is the one that he is. Amen. And I can, I can picture that. I can picture a great revival taking place. I've heard your pastor preach. I've heard your pastor sing. I know his heart. And I can see God moving mightily in and through his life. Now, I, you, need to, you need to make certain that you're praying for him daily. Praying that he would be strengthened. Praying that God would open doors because God desires to use him and to use you. That's the other thing I can see. I can see people that thought that their life was, uh, was helpless and worthless. I can see them being uh, touched by the hand of God, and I can see new ministries opening up. Yes. I can see a church that's full of ministers, yes, Lord. because yes. we've all been called yes. to work for the kingdom of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. A lot of people in our society are living a religious life. You know, they religiously go to church. They try to keep the Ten Commandments, but they're not living a godly life. They're not doing everything that they could. But you've got to have God's Spirit. You've got to have Him. Remember, Jesus had been with His disciples for three and a half years. He taught them, He trained them. Uh, he even sent them out at different times into the villages to preach the Gospel. But that wasn't enough. They needed to wait for the power to live that uh, godly life. They needed to tarry. You know, we're in a place now in the Pentecostal churches where uh, we understand that you don't have to wait a long time to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can be saved today, you can be filled the same day, you know, just moments later. But there was something about the early Pentecostal churches where they would tarry for the, for the infilling. They would wait, they would confess their sins, they would pray and seek God and weep before the altar. And uh, God moved, and He moved in hearts and lives. Many got called into ministry. And uh, there's, there's something about waiting. There's something about that waiting to see God. And I know that's what you're doing, you're waiting. You've had promises that, you know, from the Lord that He was going to move. And you continue to wait, God bless you. It says in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit on many days from now. He, wanted, he went on to explain why they needed to wait. And I know that Pastor Sam has just been preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the need for the Holy Spirit's uh, activity and life in life in and through our hearts and lives. But Acts 1 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost is come. Uh, it says Holy Spirit. But, you know, I'm, I'm of that age where I like, to, I like to sound the Holy Ghost. Where the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the ends of the earth. The gift of God is on the table, and it's for you and for me. And we need to be growing closer to Him. We need to be asking for more and more. I don't, there's an old children's song that went, I want more of Jesus, more and more and more. I want more of Jesus than I've ever had before. I want more of his great love, rich and full and free. I want more of Jesus, so I'll give him more of me. Amen. Acts 2, 1 to 4 says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. 
And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I've come to believe that uh, the miracle wasn't so much the tongues as it was that everyone heard in their own language. That hearing was fantastic. Uh, Jews from all over Jerusalem came out to see what was happening. I remember the story that was told about the opening of the Christian Assembly Church in Elwood City. And they said that people were coming from all over and that the building was full and they had the windows open and everyone was trying to hear what was going on. Uh, Acts 2, 37 to 39 says, And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children. And that would have been great, but he goes on. It says, and to all who are far off. I don't know about you, but I'm far off from that. It's been many, many centuries since that word was given. And I'm a recipient. As many as the Lord our God will call, it says. The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is on the table. It's there by grace. And we need to be accepting everything that God has for us. I praise God for somebody that gave me a glass of water. <laughs> We've been living uh, with air conditioning for so long that uh, I've got a little bit of an allergy that started coughing and I, I feel my voice going so uh, for, for the length of this service, uh, that's probably a good thing. It, I won't be going on and on. And my wife says amen. I read where Glenn Burris, the president, the current president of the Four Square, said on Facebook this. Now Glenn was a, a friend, is a friend of mine. Uh, he was in a class just below me at, in Bible college. Um, and it, this is what he said. The real test of what you're made of is not on the good days when there's great news or when everything's going well. The real test is when you face a significant crisis or when the odds are against you, or when you're up against the wall, fighting for your very survival. You have two choices. You can rely on your inner strength and fortitude, or you can engage the same creative power that formed the universe from nothing, breathe, breathe life into mankind, and set everything in motion and in order. I choose today, he said, to partner with the great I Am, Jehovah Jireh. He's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. Amen. I can live a godly life because Jesus lives in me. The Holy Spirit dwells in my heart and life. Another thing that is on the table to enable me to live that godly life is the Word of God. I'm so thankful for the Word of God. In the message, Psalms 1, verses 1 to 3, says it this way. How well God must like you. You don't hang out at Sin Saloon. You don't slink along Dead End Road. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. Instead, you thrill to God's Word. You chew on Scripture day and night. You're a tree replanted in Eden, bearing fruit every month. Fresh fruit, never dropping a leaf always in blossom. The Word of God is on the table. We have access to it day and night. Grace has put it there. Faith partakes in it. If you're just getting spoon-fed on Sunday morning with Pastor Sam or on Wednesday night in the midweek service, 
whatever that is. Uh, you're not getting enough of the word. You'll be a spiritual whip. We don't want to be a spiritual whip. We don't want to be strong in the word. How sad it is today that there are so many uh, Christians that are spiritually illiterate. They don't know who they are in Christ. They, uh, they don't know the awesome power of God's spirit within them. They don't understand that they can do great exploits in the name of Jesus Christ. They don't know the authority that God has given them. They're ignorant of Satan's schemes, so they're always falling into bondage. Psalms 119, 105 says, The word is a lamp unto my feet, it's a light unto my path. So the word is going to keep us out of the ditch. The word is what's important for our hearts and for our lives. I recognize that I'm not sharing with you any new revelation. I'm giving you a review of things. But I don't know about you, but I need a good Amen. review once in a while. I, I need to go back to the basics. They tell me I never got into sports. My sport was fishing, uh, hunting, uh, never got into you know, football, baseball, those things. But they tell me a lot of times as uh, they're preparing to get into the game, uh, as they're preparing their, to the players, they go back to the basics. They're training them uh, again and again in, in how to do the basics. That's kind of what we're doing this morning. We're going over some of those basic truths. Instead of being victorious in this dark world, so many people are living as a victim, just a statistic of a failed Christian life. Spiritual food is here for our taking. It's God's Word. Uh, in 1 Peter 2.2 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Uh, desire speaks of <coughs> craving. Do you crave the Word of God? Uh, it, it's a longing, a yearning. Far too many believers are like the Christians in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3 it says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you're still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Paul told young Timothy, in uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To study, to dig into the word, to begin to uh, do word studies and, and chapter study, book studies, uh, just feed on it. Do you memorize the word? That's a rough one for me. Uh, this, this brain's getting a little old. But we need to memorize the word. I can live that godly life because the Spirit of God dwells within me. Amen. And He set the table with the word of God that enables me to grow and to live a godly life. Healing is also on the table. Psalms 103, verses 2 to 3 says, Well, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things that He does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. That three-letter word is one of my favorites in Scripture. The word all. Because it includes me. I went to a doctor a few years ago and was diagnosed as having a hole in my retina. And uh, they made an appointment with a ophthalmologist, a, a, a doctor, specialist, <laughs> specialist out of Pittsburgh. And uh, so I went down, the, the, it was scheduled for a Thursday, and uh, so Wednesday night I'm in prayer meeting or Bible study there at the church, and I had the pastor and some of his staff pray for him, anoint me with oil and pray for him. 
And so they, they prayed, and uh, I went down for that appointment, and that doctor pulls out all of these instruments, all of these little gadgets, you know, looking in my eye, uh, every which way, every direction. And she says, I can find no hole in your retina. God. God healed it. Praise the Lord. God healed it. Praise the Lord. I had some skin cancers on the top of my head that were removed. And uh, I had the, the uh, number one man in the in the cancer department at the University of Wisconsin uh, diagnosed it. He looked at me and he says, this is without a doubt cancer. And uh, so I had him removed. And the pathology, uh, we had prayer. The pathology report comes back and it says that there was no cancer. There was cancer before, but there was no cancer after. Hallelujah. God is the healer. He's the great physician. <laughs> He's still on the throne. We say, well, why are some healed and some are? I don't know. Somebody asked Kenneth Hagin one time, uh, they, they asked him what he would do if he prayed for somebody in a healing line and they died. And he looked at him and he said, I'd say next. Uh, you know, because he's not the healer. He's not the healer. God is. And God calls us to, to pray for the sick. To pray for the sin. God's healing is on the table. He heals all my diseases. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Hallelujah. He's the healer. Amen. Provision is on the table. Philippians 4, 19. And my God shall supply all of your wants. No, I'll supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You have a need, we take it to God. He meets the need. We were pastoring a small church. It wasn't any bigger than this one in uh, Minnesota. It was time for vacation, and we needed a vacation. And uh, we weren't getting a, a paycheck. And uh, I had worked for John Deere a few years before. And uh, I get a check in the mail for, uh, I don't remember how much it was, but it paid for our vacation. He supplies all of our needs. I needed that vacation. And God, God saw that need. Power and authority are on the table. Adoptions on the table. Romans 8, 14 to 17 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. Uh, that's the kind of relationship he wants with us. He wants to, to be that close to us. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, then we may also be glorified together. All of these things are on the table, and many other things are on the table that for us to partake of. But our, in our original text there in St. Peter, uh, in 2 Peter, uh, there was one condition. In the Message Bible, it says it this way. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us. Here is the condition. By getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. Amen. Salvation is for those who personally and intimately know him. What do you need today? What's on the table that you can receive from? We're, uh, we're going to close. But I want you to know that if you have a need, even though your pastor's away, uh, we'll pray for you. We'll, we'll pray and ask God to, to meet that need. Anyone with a need as we close?
God was good. Let's pray. Father God, how we thank you and we praise you that you have provided everything that we have need of. I know, Lord, that we're not giving any kind of fresh revelation here. These are just uh, basic truths. The Lord God, I pray that we'll take these and the Lord Jesus will apply them to our hearts and lives. For Lord, we want to be everything that you have for us. And Lord, we want, as part of this church, we want to be on the cutting edge of what you're doing in Darlington and in Elwood City and all of the surrounding communities. We want to be on the cutting edge uh, to see souls come to a knowledge of you as Lord and Savior, to see the sick healed, to see those that are bound uh, delivered and set free in Jesus' name. And so, Lord God, we pray and we ask, Lord, that you would minister to our hearts and lives. And, Lord, we pray for Pastor Sam and Tracy. We ask, Lord God, that you would be with them during this time of vacation. We pray that you would strengthen them. We pray, Lord God, that you would open their hearts and minds to the things, Lord, that you desire to do in and through their lives as well as in and through this congregation. Lord, we ask a blessing upon this congregation. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's children said? Amen. Praise the Lord. Sister? Yes.